This is my first video update coming to you from a rainy Athens, Greece. Let's talk about some news. We have an announcement coming from the Bidenopolis White House. Greece's favorite son, Joe Bidenopolis, has announced that they will be giving Ukraine another $3 billion in, uh, in weapons. And this is going to coincide with uh, Ukraine's Independence Day, the, the like official signing of uh, more weapons for uh, Ukraine so that they can create this, this nice narrative of 3 billion USD on the, uh, the day of independence for Ukraine, which I think is August 24th or 26th. I'm not sure it falls on one of those days, but uh, this three billion that uh, Bidenopolis is going to be giving to Ukraine is uh, is actually going to be well, it's going to be ammunition and air and building air defenses, but uh, it's going to be targeted not only for short term but for medium and long term. Um, weapons to Ukraine. Let, let me read you what Reuters said here. One second, let me pull it up. It was raining really, really hard. It has stopped now, but I think it's going to start up again. Let's see. U.S. announces $3 billion in new military aid for Ukraine. The United States will announce a new security assistance package for Ukraine of about $3 billion as early as Wednesday, a U.S. official said on Tuesday, in what would be the single largest tranche to Kiev since Russia's invasion six months ago. The package is being prepared to coincide with Ukraine's Independence Day on Wednesday. So today, today, the package uses funds from the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, USAI, appropriated by Congress to allow the Biden administration to procure weapons from industry rather than taking weapons from existing U.S. weapons stocks. In other words, the way I'm reading this is that uh, this money is, uh, okay, it's not going to be coming from U.S. Uh, U.S. stockpiles, but it's just basically uh, contracts to the military industrial complex. Am I reading that correctly? Uh, allows the Biden administration to procure weapons from industry, i.e. the military industrial complex, rather than taking them out of your stockpiles. Yeah. Speaking on condition of anonymity, the official said the new weapons did not appear to include types of arms that had not been provided previously to the Ukraine military, but the official said it would focus on ammunition, okay, and more medium-term objectives like defense systems medium-term objectives. In other words, they're hoping, they're preparing for, uh, for this war to, to drag on, right? But uh, contracts, $3 billion to the military-industrial complex, that's pretty much what, what this is. That's what this is about. So uh, $3 billion to, uh, to Ukraine on, uh, on Independence Day today, on Ukraine Independence Day. And I said in my video yesterday that uh, they don't want this to end. The, uh, the government officials, the Biden White House, the military industrial complex, the globalists, the Davos elite, all of these people are making a ton of money. They don't want this to end. Uh, Germany has also said that they're going to, uh, the Schultz government said it's going to give uh, 500 million in weapons to Ukraine including uh, MLRS and uh, also some air defense systems as well. And the difference between Germany and the United States is that Germany is going to uh, dig into whatever they have left in their stockpiles, which is very, uh, very little from what I understand. And they're going to, uh, to hand it over to Ukraine. Of course, what that means is that Germany will then um, sign contracts with more military industrial uh, complex companies with more MIC companies, and they're going to, to sign contracts to get all new weapons. So you see how this is all unfolding. They want this, uh, they want this thing to, to extend. They don't want this to end. Uh, the Turkish foreign minister, he said as much uh, yesterday 
he said in a statement that the West wants this conflict to drag on. <laughs> I said this yesterday in a video as well. I was like, look, they want this thing to go on and on because this is easy freaking money. They don't want this, uh, this conflict to end in a week or two. They're hoping this thing will last two, three, four, five years because they're all making cash, whether it's uh, making money through the procurement of, uh, of weapons or whether it's just sending cash to, uh, to the Ukraine regime, which that money, after various Ukraine politicians get their cut, you know, goes right back, back outside, goes right outside of Kiev and uh, back into the, into the pockets of all the politicians. It, it, it gets washed. It gets washed. But uh, Kavosuglu, the Turkish foreign minister, he was speaking to uh, Turkish language outlet Haber Global, and uh, he stated that several Western countries want the war to continue, adding that it is not only the U.S., but also a handful of NATO members. Apart from this, he did not mention any specific states. There were also those who wanted to sabotage the grain deal, though he noted that the U.S. was not one of those countries that wanted to sabotage the grain deal. The U.S. contribution was as follows, the removal of export barriers for Russian fertilizers, unblocking ports, lifting restrictions on banking transactions. But some countries from Europe wanted to sabotage it, he said, signaling that Turkey continues to work to make sure the grain deal is upheld. All right. So uh, he, he states that with the grain deal, as we noted on, uh, on the Duran, that... Uh, that the U.S. was one of those countries, and a lot of countries um, wanted to wanted to have the grain the grain deal go through. Not so much to get the grain out of Odessa, but so that the restrictions could be lifted from uh, from the Russian side of things, because that was the part that was really worrying the uh, the collective West. Not not the fiction of grain from Odessa, but the uh, the stupid sanctions that were placed on Russian fertilizer and grain, which was was leading to to a big time uh, uh, food shortage. But uh, the interesting comment from Kavotsuglu is that uh, many Western countries, several Western countries, want the war to continue. They want the war to continue because it's good business. It is very good business. That is why it was, uh, it was a money-making machine with very little effort for, for the collective West over many, many years. Since, uh, since the Maidan and Victoria Nuland, uh, her announcement that the U.S. was, was putting in $5 billion to Ukraine. Remember that? In 2014, Nuland gave a speech and she said, we've already given $5 billion to Ukraine in order to get this regime change moving. And then you had the Maidan and you had the, uh, the regime change. Ever since then, it's been really easy money for uh, the military industrial complex, for NATO, for, uh, for all kinds of, of, of neoliberal multinational corporations, NGOs, uh, all of these guys were just making tons of money. The IMF um, pouring in money into, into Ukraine through loans, the EU, and then that money just goes right back out and no one noticed. You know, I, I, I remember in 2000, what was that, I think like 2013, 14, like around that time period when uh, the European Union decided to, uh, to do a bail-in in, in uh, the Cypriot banks and the Cyprus banks and decided to steal people's money in Cyprus. Uh, they decided, they did this, they said, look, Cyprus needed 10 billion, about 10 billion uh, euros to get out of its, uh, its banking hole that it was in. The EU said, nope, no chance. We're not going to give you 10 billion. We'd rather shut down one bank, uh, shut down half of the operations of another bank, the two largest banks, and we'll just take the money. A, a bank robbery, You're a, a typical <laughs> bank robbery. I mean, you know, it was very, very, uh, uh, very aggressive and very simple what the European Union did for Cyprus. But as Cyprus was looking for 10 billion, like six months later, the EU gave 20 billion to Ukraine. Just like that, 20 billion, boom. No questions asked, no one noticed about it, no one talked about it, it wasn't reported anywhere. My point in all of this is, is to say that they were giving money to Ukraine over and over again, over, you know, eight, nine, 10 years. 
And no one really reported on the money that was going into Ukraine, whether it was the US, whether it was the IMF, whether it was the EU, whether you're talking about NGOs, whatever. Money was, was flowing into Ukraine, weapons dealers, and it was coming right back out. You know, someone had to build the, uh, the fortifications that took eight years to build in the Donbass. Someone was giving all the uh, Ukraine troops uh, uh, weapons and, and gear and ammo and everything, you know, that, that turned the Ukraine military into perhaps the, the second most powerful military in NATO. Um, definitely the most powerful military in, uh, in NATO in Europe and perhaps the second or the third most powerful military in NATO. Uh, behind the United States and Turkey. I mean, you know, talking about like ground troops, you know, Ukraine, they turned Ukraine into, into a strong army. Oh, that money had to come from somewhere over the last eight, nine years. Anyway, uh, by, uh, Hunter Biden and Burisma and all of these guys, Devin Archer and, and uh, Hines and, and all of these, uh, these guys that were, you know, in Ukraine as consultants. It was easy money and Putin ruined it. <laughs> That's why they're so mad at Putin. That's one of the reasons why they're so upset with Putin, because he ruined the damn game. He spoiled their game, man, and they're pissed off. This was easy money that no one was noticing. No one was calling it out. Five billion there, 10 billion there, one billion there. It was this was going on every six months and no one, you know, no one, no one knew about it. It wasn't being reported on. Easy money. Anyway, um, <laughs> I thought I would report that. And, uh, and yeah, another three billion to, uh, to Ukraine, which will, uh, which will be good, <laughs> which will not be uh, put to, to any type of uh, good use for the people of Ukraine. It's going to go to, to the MIC and, and all of these guys anyway, and it's not going to go to the people of the United States. Three billion. That doesn't go to the people of the United States either. So uh, shifting gears, actually not shifting gears so much. Uh, UN's NATO chief, uh, UN, the NATO chief, Stoltenberg, he gave a speech yesterday saying that uh, this war is going to, uh, to come with a price for European uh, citizens, for the citizens of NATO. He said, what we are seeing is unprecedented support from NATO's European allies, Germany, Canada, the United States, and many other countries around the world. I took part in uh, Elensky's Crimea platform today, and the message sent there by all the leaders present was clear. We stand behind Ukraine, and we will support it as long as it's necessary. This is the message from NATO's allies. However, Stoltenberg said that providing military assistance to Kiev was not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. It requires hard work. I'm committed to working with other alliance leaders in Europe and North America to ensure that we continue to secure support. ZDF quoted the NATO uh, Secretary General as saying he pointed to Germany's significant contribution there and said hopefully the German government would do more. Stoltenberg also warned that the coming winter would be tough. Quote, this is the best, this is the best uh, line of his, uh, of his statement. We will pay a price for our support to Ukraine as a consequence of the sanctions. And of course, the fact that Russia uses energy as a weapon, he said in the interview. But we must understand that there is no alternative to our support. When he says we will pay a price, he means us, you, me, all the citizens of, uh, of NATO countries. He's not talking about himself or his family or his buddies <laughs> or anything like that. He's saying all of us will pay a price. And then he's also saying, we're going to drag that on for as long as we can. <laughs> we don't have a choice. When he means we, he means us, <laughs> me and you. We don't have a choice. Uh, NATO wants to drag this on for as long as possible. And they want us to continue to pay the price for as long as possible because, well, they're, they're making good on it. They're making money off of all of this. They don't want this to end. <laughs> that was his statement. We must understand that there is no alternative to our support. Well, of course, there's an alternative to our support, uh, Mr. Stoltenberg. And, and when he says our support, you know, he's, he's talking about our taxpayer money, not, not their taxpayer money, our taxpayer money. But of course, there's an, there's an a, a alternative. Just tell Alensky to uh, sign a peace agreement and end this thing. 
there's your there's a simple alternative roll back the sanctions that's another alternative <laughs> there, i've just given you two very simple alternatives <laughs> these guys man yeah, and we live in a democracy okay <laughs> okay so those were the statements from uh, stoltenberg which actually follows along the lines of giving more weapons to uh, to ukraine and more money and keeping this thing going and so the video update i did yesterday is also following along those same lines it's all of these guys just uh telling the uh telling the world that uh, they don't want this to end this is good business and we don't want any of this to end that's all they're saying let's keep this thing going for as long as we can that's their message to all of us um and, and we have to prepare for a hard winter right in order to make them rich or to keep them getting richer and richer we, the people, we're going to have to prepare to become poorer and poorer. That's basically what they're telling us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that Crimea, that Crimea summit conference, whatever that thing is, uh, Elensky, he said that uh, that Ukraine is going to uh, seize Crimea by any means necessary. That is what uh, what Elensky said during his speech. Ukraine President Zelensky announced on Tuesday that Ukraine will take the Russian territory of Crimea by military force if necessary and without consulting any country, including Kiev's Western backers. The Ukraine's military strikes on the peninsula have thus far been limited. Speaking at the so-called Crimea platform, a Ukrainian organized gathering of 60 nations and international organizations that back Kiev's claims of sovereignty over Crimea, Zelensky said that Ukraine is strong and powerful enough to make the idea of a Ukrainian Crimea a reality. Quote, we will return Crimea by any means that we consider correct without consulting with other countries, Zelensky said. According to strana.ua, a Ukrainian news outlet, I know that Crimea is with Ukraine and is waiting for us to return. We need to win the fight against Russian aggression. Therefore, we need to free Crimea from occupation. The only problem... Well, there's many problems, but let me give you two problems, uh, Elensky. The first problem is that you don't have the capabilities to uh, take Crimea. That's the first problem. You're not even remotely close to having those capabilities to take Crimea. NATO doesn't have the capabilities to take Crimea, so Ukraine definitely does not have those capabilities. And your other problem is that the people of Crimea, they don't want uh, Elensky. They don't want you to, quote, unquote, take Crimea. <laughs> they don't want it. They're perfectly happy uh, being a part of Russia. Period. Where historically, they have always been. So that's th those are just two of many, many problems with Zelensky's uh, statement. But he had to give these speeches. He had to uh, put these speeches out there because, you know, you got to keep the, the weapons flowing, you got to keep the money flowing. Got to keep the game going. He's an actor, uh, after all. And you know, giving speeches like this, giving these dramatic speeches, is, is pretty much second nature for uh, for the actor comedian uh, Andres Duda. The uh, the president of Poland was also at this uh, this Crimea platform meeting, and uh, Duda, well, he actually got a star like. It, in Kiev, they actually have something like the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but I guess it's for uh, for politicians that support the uh, Elensky regime, and uh, they give these people stars on uh, on the sidewalk. And Duda actually got uh, a star, <laughs> which is which is interesting. You know, in Hollywood, you have entertainers with their star. So in in, in Kiev, you have uh, politicians who uh, who get stars on on the sidewalks but uh polish president uh, duda he uh he called for a complete dismantling of russia's nord stream 2 gas pipeline when russia is at war against ukraine when it attacks occupies the change of policy in the west implies not only the suspension of nord stream 2 but also the liquidation the complete dismantling of the pipeline this is what he said uh, when he was in kiev during this uh, crimea platform and so yeah, <laughs> why not? Why not listen to uh, to Duda? Let's go for it. Just dismantle Nord Stream 2 and be done with it. Uh, let's, let's make sure 
let's make sure that Germany has no options. Let's make sure that Germany uh, is deindustrialized and collapses. Poland um, has actually come out with a lot of bellicose rhetoric towards Germany over the past couple of days. They're, uh, they're not fans of Germany, it seems, which is kind of interesting. But uh, I guess Poland senses that, uh, that Germany was the, uh, the big dog in the European Union. And now I guess uh, Duda is sensing that perhaps they can be the, uh, the big dog in the European Union. So in order to be the big dog, you have to, you have to get rid of the, uh, the, previous, the previous leader of the, of the group, and that is Germany. So it looks like Duda is, is saying, you know what? Let's just make sure that there's absolutely no chance for Germany to reconcile with Russia and to perhaps save its collapsing economy. And let's dismantle Nord Stream 2. Alensky liked that idea, actually. He really liked that idea. And uh, he said, you know what? <laughs> yeah, no, not Alensky. Some people in the, in the Ukraine parliament, to be fair, some people in the Rada, they really liked Duda's idea. And they said, you know what? Let's take it one step further and just confiscate all the Russian gas that transits through Ukraine. <laughs> this is what uh, one Ukrainian parliament member, Dmitry Razumkov, uh, stated. He said that Kiev has the right to confiscate Russian gas that flows to the EU through Ukraine and sell it in order to solve the country's economic problems. The gas that is transported through the territory of Ukraine is Russian to the border with Europe. It is Russian gas. And if we act in accordance with law, we should confiscate it. This is what he said in a video post on Facebook on Friday. And uh, why not? <laughs> let's do that as well. <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> let's confiscate that Russian gas that's flowing through Ukraine and let's sell it onwards to Europe because the EU is not going to mind this. Nah, they're not going to be bothered with this type of, uh, of confiscation. They'll tell the Ukraine authorities, yeah, sure. Just uh, confiscate that gas and resell it to us. Mark it up while you're at it. Make it more expensive while you're at it, uh, Ukraine. And of course, the Russians aren't going to care. They're going to be perfectly fine with this. They're not going to, uh, to shut down the gas transiting Ukraine if they see Ukraine is uh, confiscating that gas and reselling it, are they? Nah, not a chance. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Who's, who wants to destroy... Uh, the economies of the EU more? Is it Russia or is it uh, some, some member states of the European Union and Ukraine? I'm starting to think that some member states of the EU and the Alensky regime are uh, more interested in destroying the economies of the, the economies of EU member states than Russia is, uh, is actually interested in doing. It's, it's hard to figure out who uh, Germany's worst enemy is. Is it Germany itself? Is it the Greens? Is it Alensky? Is it Poland? Is it the United States? Because the more this conflict plays out, it sure as hell isn't Russia. <laughs> That's for sure. So what other news do I have here? Ah, okay. Here's, here's an interesting, quick uh, study in Collective West mainstream media confusion and propaganda. So the Wall Street Journal came out with an article the other day, and uh, let me find the title of that article here. First, let me cross the street, make sure I don't get hit by a car here. All right, cool. We're good to go. So they had an article with the title, After Six Months of War in Ukraine, Momentum Tilts Against Russia. Now, you go through the article and they start talking about the Kherson. They're, they're still talking about the Kherson counteroffensive. No joke. They're actually, they actually believe that you're going to have a Kherson counteroffensive. Um, and they say basically that Russia's screwed. That after six months of fighting, Ukraine finally has the upper hand and Alensky's going to win the war and he's going to march all the way to Moscow. Blah, blah, blah. All right. So that was the title from the Wall Street Journal. Pretty much the same day you had an article coming out of uh, Australia from The Age, 
which says six months on, Ukraine is losing the war with Russia. <laughs> so which one is it? Is it uh, Ukraine is winning the war against Russia? Or is it Ukraine is losing the war with Russia? I guess if you ask uh, Australian mainstream media, it's uh, Ukraine is losing the war. If you're asking the Wall Street Journal, Ukraine is winning the war. So I, I think the two uh, Collective West mainstream media publications need to uh, perhaps coordinate their propaganda efforts a little bit better. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. <laughs> they have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Look, uh, Alexander is documenting it really well. Go to his channel. Uh, we've talked about it on this channel. We've talked about it a bunch on the Duran. We actually did a video on it yesterday on the Duran. Uh, all signs are pointing to, I've said this in a couple of videos as well over the past week, all signs are pointing to uh, Russia with... Uh, Russia is getting, uh, is putting together a very powerful uh, advance towards Nikolaev. There, uh, it, it looks like this advance is already uh, very successful. From what I understand, Russia, Russia has already captured many, uh, many villages and territories towards Nikolaev. I've heard reports saying that uh, Russia is 20 kilometers away from Nikolaev and there's some colorful analysts saying that that the Russian military, they're uh, they're approaching Nikolaev from two fronts, and they can see the the city with their binoculars, and they're preparing the uh, the advance towards this this big city. There's a city about the size of uh, Mariupol, and once they uh, once they get Nikolaev, it's Odessa. If you look on a map, once you get Nikolaev. You're uh, you're making a beeline towards uh, towards Odessa, or maybe around Odessa and encircling Odessa. Uh, but this is just the reality of the situation in the Donbass in Donetsk. It looks like you're just a couple of weeks away from the uh, the taking or the liberation, depending what side you're on of uh, Donetsk as well. The Russians, it looks like they're they're close to capturing uh, Marinka. They're about to encircle the very a uh, heavily fortified city of Avdivka, which is a city that was shelling the uh, the city of Donetsk, and and Marienka is also a very heavily fortified city. All the fortified, all the fortifications of Ukraine that we were talking about in the beginning of the video that NATO and the Collective West spent so much money uh, building, they're uh, they're cracking and and they're coming undone. And uh, as they continue to crack, the Russians continue to to advance and it's just a matter of time and um, I've heard from a lot of various sources that that the Russians are absolutely 100% motivated to uh, to move towards Odessa and also Kharkiv let's not forget Kharkiv I've heard that there's another big advance that is uh, being planned and is taking place uh, towards uh, the Kharkiv region as well so that is the reality of the situation. Um, in this case, it looks like Australian media has it right and the Wall Street Journal, well, they've got it completely wrong. So with that being said, and, and by the way, we've gotten confirmation from the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense that they are making significant advances towards Nikolaev. And when the Russian Ministry of Defense says this, take it to the bank because the Russian MOD they usually wait a couple of days until they're 100% certain that things are working out well before they make announcements, announcements like this. Russian troops have made advances into Ukraine's Nikolaev region, a strategically important area in the south of the country. The Defense Ministry of Moscow reported on Tuesday, according to the ministry's spokesman, Lieutenant General Igor Konashenko, Russian and allied forces have destroyed Ukrainian military units defending the town of Alexandrovka and managed to reach the administrative border of Nikolaev region. The town is in Ukraine's Kherson region, which has mostly been under Russian control for months. It lies on the coast of the Dnieper, a bug estuary through which the waters of both rivers flow into the Black Sea. So that is coming straight from the Russian Ministry of Defense. Once again, when they come out with statements like this, they're 100% certain of their uh, of their success. So that is uh, what's really going on on the ground. I have read, and I'll throw it out there. 
I'll just throw it out there. I have a read Ukrainian um, Telegram, Twitter analysis and, and various other blog analysis that, uh, and I'm going to throw it out there, that the Ukraine military is allowing Russia to advance towards uh, Nikolaev because they've set up a trap. It's a trap. You know, kind of like, what, what is the... Uh, what was that movie? Was it the Star Wars movie? Was it uh, The Empire Strikes Back? Or was it Return of the Jedi? Where you have the Admiral, I forgot his name. I used to know all these characters. Where the Admiral is saying, it's a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> with uh, with uh, the attack on the Empire, the rebel forces were attacking the Empire. And he's like, it's a trap. So um, maybe the script writers, maybe they're Star Wars fans. And the, the script writers in Kiev are, are throwing out this this narrative that the advance towards Nikolaev, the Ukraine military is letting them do that because this is all one elaborate uh, trap for the Russian military. Anyway, so let's do a clown world. Let's do a clown world. And we have to talk about Finland's dancing queen, <laughs> the dancing queen of Finland, Sanna Marin. How do those lyrics go? You can dance, you can jive, having the time of your life. <laughs> see that girl watch that watch that scene looking at the dancing queen is that are those the lyrics well <laughs> santa marin man she is the dancing queen she is partying it up because you had another photo that made its way in uh in finland on twitter on telegram all over the place and this is a photo which uh allegedly was taken after uh, a music festival, a rave, uh, something, a concert, which uh, Santa Marin attended back in July in Helsinki. And then she invited all of these people who were at this concert. She invited them back to the prime minister's official residence. And she had a, a big time party, uh, an after party after this, uh, this music festival concert. And in this photo, I, won't I will not put it up on the, on the screen. Not that it's anything bad, but once again, YT, who knows how they'll moderate this image, but it's basically two, uh, two influencers. I guess they're Instagram influencers or TikTok influencers at uh, the prime minister's residence and they're kissing and they have the word Finland. Is, is that how it goes? Yeah, they have the word Finland on their, uh, over their, their breasts, over their exposed rests with one holding a sign reading Finland to cover herself. The photo surfaced this week shows two women kissing as they lift their tops to expose their breasts with one holding a sign reading Finland to cover herself. Uh, Marin confirmed that the picture had been taken at the prime minister's official residence in Helsinki in July. And Marin said that she had invited several guests back to the house after a music festival. <laughs> she apologized on Tuesday for the photograph after it surfaced. <laughs> what is going on in Finland, man? What is going on there? How can I get to Finland? I need to book a flight to Finland and see what's going on. This is incredible. What kind of partying is she doing? <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> man, I don't know what to say. I'm, uh, I'm at a loss for words, really. I really am at a loss for words. Uh, well, let's see. She said, Santa Marin said, in my opinion, the picture is not appropriate. I apologize for it. That kind of a picture should not have been taken. But otherwise, nothing extraordinary happened at the get together. <laughs> the get together. It was an after party, right? It's, but, but it was an after party at the prime minister's official residence. I, I'm just trying to picture what's, what's going on. Does she attend this music festival? And then she like just tells everybody at the festival, hey party at the prime minister's uh house <laughs> I mean, is that is that how this works uh what kind of security was there what what uh i mean are people screened are people patted down or are are people like cross-checked in some sort of database to make sure they're not going to do anything or commit some sort of uh terrible act or i mean uh, how does this work how, <laughs> what's going on there Anyway, I'm not going to say anything more. I might get in trouble if I if I say anything more about about this incident. This is our clown world, and and Santa Marin, to be quite honest, she's uh, she's dominating clown worlds of uh, 
of late. I mean, she is absolutely dominating. And uh, this one, well, I don't know. I, 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 I'm speechless. I really am. You know, all the talk about, uh, you know, what's Russia going to do if Finland joins NATO? And, you know, what about this, uh, this rhetoric coming out of Finland, Finland with regards to uh, blocking off the Baltic with Estonia to, uh, to Russian ships and, and Finland, you know, putting together a travel ban and, and all of this stuff that, you know, we've been talking about and analyzing and saying, you know, we're moving towards dangerous territory and Russia needs to take these threats seriously. And, you know, this is dangerous stuff. You know what? Just, just forget all of that. I don't think Russia has anything to worry about, honestly. <laughs> I think this is... You know, this is like, uh, it's like a party palace, it seems, with uh, Santa Marin. <laughs> Dancing queen. <laughs> Anybody could be that guy. The night is young and the, and the music is high. <laughs> I will leave it there, everybody. Vidurea.locals.com. Uh, Odyssey, BitChute, Rumble and Telegram. Check us out on those platforms and uh, Alexander's channel. He's, he's got all the, all the latest news and analysis in detail with regards to the real offensive, not the fake counter, not the fake Herson counter offensive, but the real offensive towards Nikolaev that is taking place and uh, the Duran channel as well, where you will get all kinds of great analysis and live streams. Take care. <music>